All right. <clears throat> All right. Well, today we are going to do chapter eight. Chapter eight is acids and bases. Um, you will need your calculator if you want to get it formed up. There are some here if you got one. We're going to start out, of course, talking about water, hydrogen bonding, and the process of autocotolysis. Then we're going to do ionization of molecular compounds, strong acids, strong bases, conjugate acid-base pairs, the concept of neutrality, and the pH scale. And finally, pH calculations. That's the fun part. <clears throat> when you are doing the pH calculations today, there are two buttons that you need to think about. One is the log button on your calculator, and the other one is 10 to the x. Now on mine, I have to hit the green button and then hit this again to get 10 to the x. If you have your calculator out, try this. Type in 3,000. Hit the log button. You should get 3.477 plus some other digits. Then find the 10 to the x. Well, this is still at the screen. Hit 10 to the x, and you should be back at 3,000. Any questions? All right. In Chapter 7, we talked about electronegativity and the fact that most covalent bonds are actually polarized. <clears throat> the OH bond is significantly polarized because the electro electronegativity of hydrogen and oxygen differs significantly. That generates a molecular dipole with the bottom half of the molecule being positive and the top half being electron rich or negative. We saw the electrostatic potential map that confirmed that. Again, blue represents electron deficiency down here by the hydrogens, and the red excess electrons by the oxygen and the lone pairs. The fact that water is a very polar molecule, we said, was the thing that allowed it to dissolve ionic compounds in solution. <clears throat> what happens is the polar water molecules will wrap themselves around the anionic portion of the molecule with the positive ends pointing in, opposite over here with the cation, negative end pointing in, this allows water to disperse the charge. By dispersing the charge, you make these things stable in solution. That was chapter seven. Any questions? All right, I contend that if water is able to interact with cations and anions, that it should also be able to interact with itself. So here's a water molecule. What I'm going to do is bring another water molecule up to it. I'm going to orient it in such a way that the anionic portion is down here pointing at one of the hydrogens. So something like this. When I do, we see that a bond is formed between the oxygen end and the hydrogen. This is referred to as a hydrogen bond. It's actually a very weak covalent bond because these guys are sharing these electrons. 
it's about 5% of the strength of a normal covalent bond. If you look at the water molecule, however, we could easily do it again on this side, bring another water in, and get a second hydrogen bond. Up here on top, we have the negative end of one water. We could bring another one in like this and get a third and actually a fourth hydrogen bond to this one water molecule. Now hydrogen bonds are weak, but if you get enough of them, they really start to add up. What we're talking about here for one water molecule are hydrogen bonds to four different adjacent water molecules. Now this guy here, this is the calculation actually. It's a snapshot of a cluster of water. And as you notice, look at this guy. <clears throat> this oxygen has darn near swallowed this hydrogen, hasn't it? It is just amazing how intense this interaction can be. Now, this interaction is very, very transient. This entire water structure rearranges 10 to the ninth times per second. Per second. So it was very, very transient. Here's a little film that's in slow motion. The purple lines represent hydrogen bonds, and it basically shows a chunk of water here, <coughs> um, all of it interacting with each other. Once again, this structure rearranges a billion times a second. Um, this is slowed down a billion fold, so we can see it. If you actually look at this carefully, you'll notice that there are some water molecules that look odd. There are some where we have only an oxygen and a hydrogen. And there are some where we have an oxygen and three hydrogens. This is the result of what is known as autoprotolysis. Basically, we have hydrogen-bonded water molecules. All that needs to happen is that somebody from somewhere bumps into one of these guys, gives it a little bit of extra energy, and this hydrogen can be transferred along the hydrogen bond from one water molecule to another. Something like this. When we do this, we generate a pair of polyatomic ions. The hydronium cation and hydroxide anion. Now, like I said, this process is very, very dynamic. This autophotolysis happens about 10 to the minus 8 seconds as a lifetime. So this can be handed back, and we're back to two waters. This can happen again. The bottom line is this process goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth constantly. 10 to the 8th times per second. What that means is that if you have absolutely pure water, absolutely pure, nothing else in it, there will be hydronium and hydroxide in there. And at 25 degrees centigrade, room temperature, the concentration of both will be 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter in absolutely pure water. You always have hydronium and hydroxide. 
Now that's an important concept, so I'll say it again. In absolutely pure water, the concentration of hydronium and hydroxide are both 10 to the minus 7 molar. Any questions? Going back to chapter 7, remember we were talking about <coughs> um, electrolytes, non-electrolytes, weak electrolytes, whatever. We looked at non-electrolytes. For electrolytes, we had a big number on our um, scale. Um, we, we were somewhere in the middle. But non-electrolytes in water were never zero, were they? They still had a real value. That's because in pure water, regardless what else is dissolved, you will have 10 to the minus 7 molar, hydronium, and hydroxide. It's always there. Any questions? Well, once again, let's ask the question, how can water do this? Hydronium looks like this as an electrostatic potential map. This is hydroxide. They are both really highly charged. Let's look at hydronium. <clears throat> this is hydronium from the top. This is looking down on the oxygen. Instead of bright red, it's pale green. From the side, you can see just how big and blue the bottom is from the positive charge. Now remember in chapter 7, we took an ion and placed three waters around it. Well, we can do the same thing here. Here's a hydronium. Here's three waters placed around it. And we're going to calculate an electrostatic potential map for the complex. Remember, this is what the water looks like at the middle of the hydronium. When we do the entire complex, the top is now starting to get yellow, and we have basically delocalized the charge over the adjacent waters. This is why it can happen, because water has this phenomenal property. But water doesn't just live in groups of four. It's best described as somewhere between eight and 12. This one has eight waters surrounding the hydronium. Here it is. So let's do a calculation over the entire complex. And when we do that, the hydronium, which is right here, right here, don't forget it's there, suddenly doesn't have just a green top. It's back to having a bright red. Water has managed to disperse the charge over the complex. That's why this can happen, and that's why water is such an amazing compound. Any questions? All right, in chapter seven, we also talked about polar um, covalent bonds, polar molecular compounds, and what we looked at was hydrogen fluoride. You know, my pointer goes out, we have to stop lecturing. This is HF, the electrostatic potential map. We said that the hydrogen end was very positive. The oxygen fluoride end, because it's the most electronegative element, was very negative. Well, if you put HF into water, water is going to come and hydrogen bond to the hydrogen end of HF. Now, as it does this, just like the process of protolysis, this hydrogen bond can break the covalent bond here, and we do this, resulting in 
hydronium ion, and fluoride. The attraction is so powerful, we have broken a covalent bond. Here's the equation for it. HF plus water, H3O plus fluoride anion. Now this reaction is reversible, just like we saw for autoprotolysis. We can go forward and we can go back. Now in chemistry, when you have reactions that go this way and this way, constantly and rapidly, that's called an equilibrium. We use a special set of arrows for that. These are equilibrium arrows. When you see those, it tells you that this reaction goes this way and this way simultaneously and very rapidly. Now, in this reaction, we have generated hydronium ion. Compounds that ionize in water and generate a hydronium ion are called acids. Hydronium is acid. Among acids, we will have two varieties, strong acids and weak acids. They basically differ by the amount of hydronium that's in solution. That's the position of this equilibrium. If the forward reaction here is very, very, very fast, and the back reaction is very, very slow, we will accumulate lots of hydronium, and it's a strong acid. If it's the other way around, if this is slow and this is fast, then most of it is going to accumulate here, little hydronium, and that's a weak acid. Now, weak acids are something that you do extensively in general chemistry. So we're going to talk mostly about strong acids. An example of a strong acid, hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen chloride is a gas. It can dissolve in water. And when it does, it forms hydronium and chloride anion. This equilibrium is shifted all the way this way. So if you take HCl gas and you allow it to dissolve in water, as soon as it hits the water, virtually 100% of it ionizes to get hydronium and chloride virtually 100%. This is a classic strong acid. Now, the back reaction here still exists. Yes, it does. But it is so slow relative to the ionization that we basically don't see any HCl. But, to be honest, there must be an undissociated HCl somewhere because of the back reaction. The ratio is roughly a billion of these guys to one of these. Any question? A weak acid. Now we saw this again in chapter seven when we were talking about weak electrolytes. This is acetic acid. It's the acidic component of vinegar, and it can dissolve in water, ionize, and form hydronium and acetate anion. But the equilibrium here is just the opposite. Instead of lots of hydronium, we have lots of undissociated acetic acid. So we put acetic acid into water, Every now and then, somebody will dissociate and then go back. The ratio here is roughly um, one hydronium to maybe 10 to the fifth 
acetates. Equilibrium totally shifted. Now again, we're not going to talk about weak acids. That's fodder for general chemistry. Weak acids, buffers, all that equilibrium stuff. That's lots of fun. I highly recommend it. But next level. Let's look at common strong acids that we deal with. We've seen hydrochloric acid giving hydronium and chloride. Nitric acid. Basically, nitrate has three oxygens and one negative charge. What we do is we put a proton on one of the on the one negative charge, and this is nitric acid. It associates to form nitrate and hydronium. It's a very strong acid. Perchloric acid is another one. HClO4. <clears throat> Again, this is a perchlorate, it's a monoanion, so we put one hydrogen on. This is the acid form. Lose it to hydronium and make perchlorate. For all three of these, we have one proton we can dissociate, and they're termed monoprotic acids. Now, everybody's favorite acid is sulfuric. Sulfuric is basically sulfate, SO4, two negative charges. We put hydrogens on both of them. We can lose these one at a time. Lose the first one, we get hydronium and hydrogen sulfate. Lose the second one, we get hydronium and sulfate. This is a diprotic acid. We lose two protons. In 110, there is one triprotic that we use. This is phosphoric acid, phosphate, PO4, with a minus three. We put three hydrogens on, and we can lose these one at a time. It's triprotic. Now there's a neat <coughs> hang on, we have to do nomenclature first. <clears throat> when you're talking about ionization, there are a couple ways you can do this. One is the conjugate acid, conjugate base pair nomenclature. The other is to describe it as a Bronsted acid. We'll do that in just a second. Conjugate acid. When you look at um, an acid ionizing in water, the conjugate acid is the thing that donates the proton to water. So here's nitric acid. It's going to donate its proton to water to give hydronium and nitrate. So this is the acid form. Once you have donated the protons, the leftovers is the conjugate base. So this is our conjugate acid. This is the conjugate base. Together, they are a conjugate acid base pair. Now, <clears throat> conjugate base basically has one less proton, we lost our proton, and one more negative charge. That can differ, but this is basically what you get. The Bronsted acid base theory <clears throat> basically only describes the ionization process. The Bronsted acid in this is the proton donor. It's the same as the conjugate acid. But Bronsted defines water as the Bronsted base because it's the proton acceptor. Once again, for conjugate acid-base pairs, 
the base is the leftovers. We've lost the proton, we're left with nitrate. Let's look at some examples. For HCl, the thing donating the proton, the bonded acid, is going to be HCl. The leftovers, after we have lost our proton, is chloride. This is the conjugate acid, and this is this base pair. For sulfuric acid, we can do it twice. Sulfuric acid donates a proton to water to get hydronium. The leftovers after the first ionization is hydrogen sulfate. That's the acid. Here's the conjugate base. Hydrogen sulfate can donate the second proton, again, to water, hydronium, sulfate is the leftover. Now this last one I put in just to be different. The Bronsted base, that is a proton acceptor, doesn't have to be water. Turns out that liquid ammonia has many of the same properties as water does. Nitric acid can donate a proton to ammonia, liquid ammonia, to give ammonium and nit nitrate as the anion. This is the conjugate acid. This is the conjugate base. Now, often when I ask a question about this on exam two, um, I will ask a question regarding the reverse reaction. So think for a second about what happens going back. For the back reaction here, what compound is the acid? And what is its conjugate base? Well, on this side of the equation, the only thing with a proton is ammonium. So it has to be the acid. The leftovers, after we lose this, are ammonia. Um, the fact that liquid ammonia can do many of the things that water can do for a long time in astronomy, got astronomers very excited because outer planets have big oceans of liquid ammonia. And we could have life based on liquid ammonia instead of water. Now it turns out that the oceans out there are probably largely water. So we don't get as excited anymore, but still, this is a very interesting phenomenon. Any questions? Well, the chapter has three tutorials. The first one, conjugate acid base pairs. <clears throat> Blackboard is very similar to this one. What you have is half of a reaction. You'll either be giving the reactants or the products, and you simply type in what's left, what's missing. Um, you have to do it in the same order. Okay, so fluoride first, then hydronium, whatever. As we look at this, something has ionized to give hydronium and fluoride anion. The question you ask is, if this is the conjugate acid, I'm sorry, the conjugate base, what is the conjugate acid? Very simply, if this is the leftovers, we put a proton on it. Here we have hydronium. What was the proton acceptor? That is the Bronsted base. Well, it had to be water. HF plus water, fluoride, hydronium. 
do another one. Here we have chlorate anion and we have hydronium. Now here, hydronium is going to be our Bronsted acid. It's going to donate a proton to chlorate. The conjugate acid of chlorate is what? That's the leftover. We put a proton on it. After we donate the proton here, what's left is simply water. Now one more. Both of these guys are acids, aren't they? But if hydrogen sulfite was the acid and donated it to hydronium, we would have H4O. That doesn't work. Therefore, H3O is going to be our bronze acid, donating it to hydrogen sulfite. What we wind up with is sulfurous acid. When hydronium loses its proton, what's left is simply water. Any questions? Again, blackboard runs pretty much the same way. All right. If there are things called strong acids, it's only fair that we have strong bases. Only fair. Strong base typically is an ionic compound. This is sodium hydroxide. It will ionize in water to form sodium and the hydroxide anion. Um, again, this is a strong electrolyte, so virtually everything is in this form. <clears throat> if we take hydroxide anion, and we allow it to react with hydronium. What do we get? Hydroxide is going to be the base. This is our acid. Donates its proton. And we get water. This is what's called an acid-base reaction. The acid reacts with the base and we form water. Now we've seen this reaction before. This is our protolysis backwards, isn't it? Here we simply took water, made hydronium and hydroxide. Again, the equilibrium lies far over here on the water side. Same thing here, water is the predominant product. I have a little cartoon to help show this. This is supposed to represent HCl in water. We have a hydronium ion. We have a chloride anion. Over here we have sodium hydroxide, sodium, and hydroxide anion. What I'm going to do is mix these two. Strong acid strong base. As soon as hydronium and hydroxide encounter each other, they will transfer the proton from <coughs> hydronium to hydroxide, and we wind up with two waters. We have sodium and chloride in solution. Basically, the reaction of a strong acid and a strong base forms a salt and water. This is now a neutral solution of sodium chloride. Reaction between equal molar amounts of strong acid and strong base gives a salt and neutral water. 
Any questions? Well, let's look at a couple old test questions here. Select the pair of substances in which an acid is followed by its conjugate base. Okay. HCl is an acid, right? So is hydronium. <clears throat> Remember, the acid will lose the proton, the leftovers are the conjugate base. If this lost a proton, there'd be nothing left. Well, that's all right. If NH3 lost a proton, what would you have? NH2, not ammonium. You have to gain a proton to do that. Hydrogen phosphate, dihydrogen phosphate. That's gaining a proton again, isn't it? Hydrogen carbonate to carbonate. Loses proton. This is the leftover. That's the answer. Once again, this guy. Acetic acid, this is gaining a proton, not losing one. All right, you look at this thing, and the first you say is, oh my goodness, there are too many words. There are. What is true? Hydrogen carbonate is an acid. Water is its conjugate base. No, actually, water here. It's the Bronsted base. Hydrogen carbonate's an acid. Carbonate is its conjugate base. If we lose the hydrogen off of this, what's left over? Carbonate. That's correct. Hydronium and hydrogen carbonate. Nope, they're not paired. Water's an acid. CO2 is a conjugate base? Nope. Remember, you're looking at leftovers. What is the conjugate acid of hydrogen sulfate? <clears throat> the base gains a proton to give the acid. There's the base. Do we put a proton on that? we get sulfuric acid. Any questions? All right. Let's move on to the concept of neutrality. <clears throat> if we have absolutely pure water, Again, absolutely pure water. We're going to have 10 to the minus 7 molar hydronium and hydroxide all the time. It's always there. That's a neutral solution. All right. 10 to the minus 7 is a very small number. It's difficult to type out and stuff like that, especially in the old days. And so chemists developed what at the time was a shorthand. Instead of using 10 to the minus 7 molar to describe hydronium and hydroxide, what they did is they took the log of it. Now the log basically is the, describes the exponent to which the number 10 must be raised to give that concentration. Log of hydronium. Now, hydronium, we said, in neutral water was 10 to the minus 7. That's a negative number. Chemists didn't like being negative, so they multiplied everything by minus 1. And they called it pH. PH, the little p in front, is actually an abbreviation for the negative of the logarithm, in this case, of hydronium. 
All right. Based in log is the number the exponent to which 10 must be raised to produce that number. If we multiply 10 by 10, that's 10 squared, isn't it? It's 100. The log of 100 is 2. It's just the exponent. 10 by 10 by 10 is 10 to the third. The log of 1,000 is 3. Again, it's just the exponent. 316 is 10 to the 2.5. The log of 316 is 2.5. Prove it. Take your calculator into 316. Push log, you should get 2.5. Now the problem we looked at at the start. So where are we? I said take your calculator and it'll be thousand. Hit log, then ten to the x. Again, what you're doing here is you're taking ten to the three point four seven seven, and that's your three thousand. Log and ten to the x. This is simply the exponent. Now, I know they don't teach logs anymore in school. They should, but they don't. <clears throat> One better nomenclature. See the little square brackets? Whenever you see square brackets in something like this, this refers to the concentration in moles per liter. So we read, we read this then as pH is the negative log of hydronium ion concentration. So, also, instead of hydronium, sometimes it's just H that works. Let's go back to neutral water, 25 degrees. Hydronium is 10 to the minus 7. <laughs> the exponent is minus 7, right? That would be the log. If we take the negative log, we're at 7. That's the pH, the negative log of hydronium. Neutral water has a pH of 7. That's where that comes from. It's because hydronium and hydroxide are both 10 to the minus 7 molar in neutral water, pH 7. If your solution is acidic, the pH will be less than 7. If the solution is basic, the pH will be over 7. And if it's exactly neutral, it will be 7. This is worth remembering. The pH is less than 7. It's acidic. Greater than 7. It's basic. Okay. Let's take this just a little bit further. If we have pH, we could also have a pOH scale. Again, that's just being fair. We would define pOH as the negative log, that's what the P means, of hydroxide ion concentration. Hydronium and hydroxide are both 10 to the minus 7 molar. If we multiply these two things together, we get 10 to the minus 14. Okay. Now, if we take the, so this is hydronium times hydroxide, 10 to the minus 14. If we take the logs, the negative logs of both sides, 
the negative log of hydronium is going to be pH. The negative log of hydroxide is pOH. And the negative log of 10 to the minus 14 is 14. This gives us two very important equations that you need to write down somewhere. Hydronium times hydroxide is always going to be 10 to the minus 14. And pH plus pOH is always going to be 14. Under all conditions at 25 degrees, hydronium times hydroxide is 10 to the minus 14. pH plus pOH is 14. Now, why is this useful? Let's take this equation and just do something quick with it. Because this is always going to be true, regardless of what these are, if you're in water, this equation is going to be true. If I tell you hydroxide was 5 times 10 to the minus 8 mole, and I ask you what was hydronium, what you would simply have to do is to take 10 to the minus 14, divide by hydroxide, and you get hydronium. If you multiply them back, you're at back at 10 to the minus 14. Any questions? Well, let's stop calculating for a minute. And let's just look at the pH scale. <clears throat> Again, anything above 7 is basic. Anything below 7 is acidic. Blood, sweat, and tears. Basically, they're about 7.3. Salt water, borax, ammonia, bleach, one molar sodium hydroxide is 14. Wait, you said anything above seven. Oh, anything above seven. Is anything acidic. above seven is a base. Anything below seven is acidic. So down here at the very bottom, one molar HCl is a zero. Stomach acid. It's amazing the stomach doesn't just eat itself. <clears throat> Lemons, bad wine, tomatoes, bad coffee. Those are all acidic substances. Now, how do you measure it? How do you measure the pH of a, of a solution? The most accurate way is to use one of these guys. Um, this is called a pH meter. Um, pH meter is basically a millivolt meter. So it's a very accurate volt meter. We have an electrode here. The electrode features a very, very paper thin um, glass electrode. When you put this electrode in our solution, you set up a potential across this, and you wind up with a voltage. You calibrate that voltage, and that determines your pH. Now, I said this is paper thin, and it is. They're also fairly expensive and extremely fragile. Back at UIC in the research lab, we used very, very good electrodes. They cost well over $1,000 each. And I can guarantee you, you get a new student in the lab, over the next couple months, they will break 20 of them. Just take it, shove it in your beaker, and oops, and get another one. So, the student grade ones that we use here um, actually have a huge plastic shield around it. It makes it less accurate, whatever. Um, but in general, you're never going to use one of these. 
because uh, breaking it is still going to be $200 a shot. Instead, he will use something called pH paper. Now, pH paper itself is a miracle substance. It's a mixture of indicators. Indicators are compounds that undergo a color change at a particular pH. Examples. Bible blue, methyl orange, bloom, creosol green, methyl red, and phenethylene. As you raise the pH, they undergo these color changes. The one that we use in lab all the time is phenethylene. That's this guy, it's an organic model. There's the uh, compound itself. As you raise the pH, you remove these hydrogens and it turns pink. It's around neutral when that happens. Well, somebody managed to figure out if you mix these things together just right, you can get pH paper by George. And when you stick this in, pH 1 is bright red down here, 7 is greenish, and up here for 11. It's blackish. It's an amazing sort of tool, and it's useful, and it works. But as clever as chemists are, we weren't the first to think of it. This is a cabbage. It's a red cabbage. If you take the red cabbage and you juice it, the cabbage juice is a natural pH indicator. It is, it really works. If you take the juice in an acidic solution, it's a lovely, intense red. As you go through neutrality, it goes to purple, then to blue, and in a basic solution, it's an ugly green. So the cabbage thought of it long before we did. Now, this is interesting, but if you happen to be a cook, it's also very important. If you take red cabbage, chop it up, and saute it, you wind up with kind of purplish sort of stuff. Red cabbage, tastes great. If you want to make a statement, however, as you're sauteing this up, add a squirt of vinegar. It makes it acidic, and your cabbage looks like this. If you want to <clears throat> make an impression going the other way, that is, you don't particularly like the people you're cooking for, instead of adding vinegar, Add a touch of baking soda. Makes it basic. Still tastes the same, but it's really disgusting. All right. In the lab, we use indicators to tell when a solution goes from being acidic to basic. This is the hallmark of general chemistry lab. It's called a titration. This is a burette. It has a little stopcock here so you can turn the liquid on and off. And this is calibrated in milliliters. Down here we have a sample with an indicator in it. What we're going to do in a titration is we fill our burette we look up here and see exactly where we're starting. So we're starting at 10 milliliters in our tube. This is designed where we have an unknown acid in our beaker. So we know what the acid is, but we don't know what's concentration. But we have a base in here, and we know the concentration. 
So, put a drop of indicator in here. Start the flow. And we stop it when we get a color change. Next, we look and see exactly the level that we stopped it. Now, we know the concentration of the base here, right? We know the volume is 25 minus 10. If you know concentration and volume, you know the number of moles that you put in here. This is neutral now. This is the same number of moles for acid. Now, the last couple labs have been a little bit compromised, sort of. Um, <clears throat> because of setup problems, um, whatever. One of the things that we were supposed to do in lab number seven that we weren't able to <clears throat> was to take samples of model dye and triprotic acids and do a simple titration. So we're doing it now. What we're going to do is put old half a mil of nitric sulfuric and phosphoric in these wells. We will add one drop of phenothiolene and then we're going to add sodium hydroxide dropwise until we get a color change. So sodium hydroxide is in here. Acid is in here with the indicator. This is a monoprotic acid. So let's just pretend we add one drop. Nothing happens. Add our second drop. And we get our color change. Sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid. Should take twice as much base. Add our first drop, second, third, and finally the fourth, we get our color change. For phosphoric acid, triprotic, that's one, that's two, and there's our color change. Couldn't quite work this into lab number seven, but it's fun to do. Any questions? All right, well, let's get quantitative. What if I tell you I have a solution and the pH of that solution is 7.23? What is the hydronium ion concentration? That's the question. Well, we know that pH is going to be the negative log of hydronium. First thing I'd like to do, get rid of our negative sign here by multiplying both sides by minus 1. Minus pH equals log of hydronium. That's simple. Next, we're going to take the anti-log. The anti-log. The anti-log of log is just the number. And the anti-log of this side is 10 to this power. So 10 to the minus pH gives us hydronium. Let's substitute. 10 to the minus 7.23 should give us hydronium ion concentration. Time to pull up the log tables. Back when I was a child, there were no calculators. So when we were faced with a problem like this, the back half inch of every science book was a log table. And you would dig down through these columns looking for 7.23 to get 
the logarithm. Now, we simply punch it in. So, if you want to play along, take your calculator, type in minus 7.23, Then, figure out how to do 10 to the x. On my calculator, it's the green button, and then 10 to the x. And by George, look what I got. 5.89 times 10 to the minus 8. That's the hydronium ion concentration. The one equation you want to make sure you write, I drew a 3 by 5 card for exam 2, is this guy, 10 to the minus pH is hydronium. Any questions? I'm sorry? Well, we did it this way. We have 10 to the minus 7.23. We type that in to our calculator. We figure out how to get 10 to the x. Everybody's calculator is different. Mine is the green button followed by this. And that's our number. That's hydronium. All right. It's not wrong with my calculator. <laughs> That's because you're using one of those. I can't figure it out either. It's there, though. It's there. I promise you it's there somewhere. It's worth spending 10 bucks getting one that works. Here's some pH values. What are the hydronium ion concentrations? I can assure you, you will have a question or so on exam two and the quizzes and all the tutorials dealing with this conversion. Okay, we remember 10 to the minus pH. Here our pH is four. So that's 10 to the minus four, that's hydronium. That's as simple as it can be. You don't even need to calculate it, right? Well, 10 to the x is 10 to the minus 12. 10 to the minus 12 over. Now is when you need the calculator. 5.5, what the heck is that? You type in. 10 to the minus 5.5, hit 10 to the x equals, and you should get 3.2 times 10 to the minus 6. 1.32, same thing. 10 to the minus 1.32, hit your 10 to the x button, that's what you got. You can have lots of digits. The pH meters that we use in the research labs could actually give numbers like this. Extremely expensive, $20,000 pH meter. But nonetheless, same process, 10 to the minus 7 point whatever. And here's our hydronium ion concentration. Any question? Let's just look at these and do a simple question, though. Here we have a bunch of pH values. Quickly off the top of your head, which of these are acidic? <coughs> Remember, anything less than 7 is acid, anything over 7 is basic. 
4 is less than 7, 12 isn't. 5.5 is less. 1.32 is less. This is over just a bit, but it's still over. These three are acidic. These two are basic. All right, let's do this backwards. What if I gave you a hydronium ion and I said, what's the pH? Well, <clears throat> pH is going to be the negative log of our hydronium. This is our hydronium. We're going to take this type in 7.04 times 10 to the minus 7. Type it right in your calculator. All you have to do to get the pH is hit the log button and then change the sign. When we hit the log button, we get minus 615. We change the sign. This is our pH. Enter hydronium. Hit log. Change the sign. The key equation here, pH minus log hydronium. Please make sure your card has both of these equations clearly written down so you can read them. All right, let's do a set. If I said hydronium was 10 to the minus 4, you would take your calculator, type in 1 times 10 to the minus 4, hit log, and you would get 2. You can do that in your head, too. 5 times 10 to the minus 4. Take your calculator, type in 5 times 10 to the minus 4, hit log, Change the sign, and you should get 3.3. Three. <clears throat> 1.37 times 10 to the minus 8. Type this whole number in. Hit log. Change the sign. 7.86. Seven times 10 to the minus seven. Type this number in. Hit log. Change this up. 6.15. Now actually on exam once, for an easy question, something that again, I thought everybody would get right. I said, we have a solution that with hydronium is 7 times 10 to the minus 7. Is this acidic, basic, or neutral? There are so many 7s here. Half the class put neutral. No. 6.15, it's acidic. And finally, 4.61 times 10 to the minus 5. Type that in. Hit log, change the sign, and we're 4.33. All right, for practice, basic pH relationships. Tutorial number two for the chapter. 
We're looking for the pH. If hydroxide is 6 times 10 to the minus 11. All right, what's your strategy here? To get pH, we need to know hydronium, don't we? But we remember, the magic thing about this type of problem is that hydronium times hydroxide is always 10 to the minus 14, isn't it? It always is. So if we know hydroxide, we simply take 10 to the minus 14 divided by hydroxide, that gives us hydronium. Ten to the minus fourteen divided by hydroxide is hydronium. Once we have hydronium, minus log gives our pH. So a substitute. This is what we were given for hydroxide. That's a constant. This is hydronium. Type this in. Hit the log button and change the sign. 3.79. <coughs> now, if you're playing along and you get the same answer, it makes you feel good. It really does. Another one. What's the pOH? And here we're given hydronium. Same logic. We're going to take 10 to the minus 14, divide it by this, get hydroxide concentration, take its negative log, and get pOH. This is a constant. <clears throat> 10 to the minus 14 divided by hydronium, minus log is pOH. Substitute. 10 to the minus 14 divided by 10 to the minus 3. We're at 10 to the minus 12. Type this in. Hit log. Change the sign. The pOH is 11.46. So last tutorial number two. Tutorial number three is even more fun. Here you have a table with four things in it, and randomly one will fill. What you do is simply type in the rest. Okay. You have to use e-notation, <clears throat> but we've done that. We don't know how to do it. Here's our pH. First thing we want to do is to convert our pH into hydronium. We can do that because 10 to the minus pH is hydronium. But even before that, we can fill this one in, the OH, because pH plus pOH is 14. Simply subtract. 3.17. Now we do this, 10 to the minus pH. Type in minus 10.83, hit 10 to the x. We're at 10 to the minus 11. Take our pOH value from up here, 3.17. Do the same process, and we're 10 to the minus Let's do one more. Here we're given hydronium. We need hydroxide, pH, pOH. Hydroxide is going to be 10 to the minus 14 divided by this. Do our simple division. 8.13, 10 to the minus 12. 
pH is going to be the negative log of this. Type it in, hit log, change the sign, 2.91. POH, we could do this two ways. We could take 14 and subtract that. Or we could simply take this, type it in, hit low, change the sign, and we're at 11. It really gets to be fun, trust me. Now, there is a problem with blackboard. There are always problems with blackboard, aren't there? The problem with Blackboard, since I wrote the code for this, I was able to build in slop. So if you entered 11.1, that'll still work. But Blackboard doesn't work that way. Blackboard wants 11.09, or it's wrong. So instead, the tutorial quiz on Blackboard will give you a series of numbers. One of these is wrong. What you have to do is figure out which one is wrong and type in the correct one. Again, you have to use the notation. So, how in the world are you going to do this? simple. We know that pH plus pOH is 14, right? So let's look at our pH and pOH and see if they're 14. If they're not, then one of these is wrong. If they are, then one of these is wrong. So step one. 8.15 plus 8.85. Well, that's 17, isn't it? Not 14. So one of these is wrong. So we've narrowed it down. Now, we go to our hydronium. We type this in, hit log, change the sign. It's 8.15. So this one's right. This one's wrong. To get the correct one, you type this guy in, hit long, change the sign. This should be 5.85. Here's the correct values. And on Blackboard, you would simply type in the correct POH value. Any questions? All right, we're almost at the end, guys. On the second hour exam, for many years, <clears throat> I gave a problem that was very similar to this one. You have a bottle of cheap red wine. You have a pH meter. You take its pH, it's 2.85. You say to yourself, no way I'm drinking that. That's red wine vinegar. Okay? Uh-uh. Forget that one. Calculate hydronium hydroxide and pOH. Let's start with hydronium. Hydronium, we know, is going to be 10 to the minus pH. This is 2.85. We're going to substitute. Type in minus 2.85, hit 10 to the x. That's hydronium. P 
DOH. <clears throat> Simplest way to do this is to remember this relationship. DH plus DOH is 14. We know our pH is given simply 14 minus this, pOH 11.15. Finally, for hydroxide, we could take the pOH value, simply plug it in here, so I substitute. We type in minus 11.15, hit 10 to the x, and that's all hydroxide. This, again, standard extra credit question. Exam 2. Are there any questions? Except maybe, what the heck is a log? All right. Here's our tutorial list. Today we did these three. pH, pH2, and conjugate acid base. Remember, the 350 still stands. There are at least two people that are above 350 already. And you're wonderful. Exam 2 is 426. Don't forget that. That's a couple weeks, maybe three weeks from now, something like that. Also, these three together are 15 points, aren't there? Now on Blackboard, under course materials, is something called the department assessment. Basically, what the department wants to know, or somebody wants to know, is do people in 110 know anything? So they have designed this quiz. And we're supposed to give it as an extra credit. It has 32 questions. <clears throat> That's 16 points. So, you do these three, you do the 16 points here. By George, you're 31 points ahead, aren't you? Do this asset assessment. The department needs the results by 412. So at 412, it disappears. Any questions? It's a quiz is all it is. It covers basically chapters one through six. Yeah. So the grade on it depends on whether we get the full 16 points? Nope. Oh. Nope. Do this is... and do well. I think it's set up so that you have four attempts, mm -hmm. um, 30 minutes per attempt, and that's it. So you'd have to get the law right to get the 16 points? Nope. Oh. You can get your Get half a 16, get eight, whatever. <clears throat> All right, well, do these, do the assessment, give lots of points, exam is coming. Okay.